Hey there folks, this is your boy Kamal once again, and today we have a really cool log trig integral. It's the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the logarithm of secant square x plus tangent to the fourth power of x. So, as you can see, there are some higher powers involved. That was a horrible dad joke. Anyway, dad jokes aside, in case you're new to the channel and you're interested in hard integrals and, you know, cool math for fun, then do hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon to make sure you don't miss out on these really nasty integrals. So, how on earth are we going to approach this problem? Well, it's perfectly reasonable when given, whenever given any combination of trigonometric functions to alter or simplify that combination to see if we can get something involving linear powers of trig functions like sine and cosine. So let's expand the secant and the tangent here as we know the secant is 1 over cosine and tangent is sine over cosine. So I can write this as the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the logarithm of 1 by cosine square x plus sine to the fourth power of x divided by cosine to the fourth power of x dx. Now some simpl simplification means I have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the logarithm. In the denominator, I have cosine to the fourth power of x, and up top we have cosine square x plus sine to the fourth power power of x dx. Now let's make use of the properties of the natural logarithm and write this as the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the logarithm of cosine square x plus sine to the fourth power of x dx minus the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the logarithm of cosine to the fourth power of x dx. And again, using the properties of the logarithm, this can be written as a coefficient instead of an exponent. Okay, cool. So now I have 4 times the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log cosine x, which is one of Euler's famous log trig integrals, which sorts out to pi by 2, negative pi by 2 times log 2, that is. And this implies that the target integral i equals 2 pi log 2 plus the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the logarithm of cosine square x plus sine to the fourth power of x dx. Now let's play around with the new argument we have for the logarithm function. So we have cosine square x plus sine to the fourth power, which could be written as sine square x squared. And sine square x can be expanded as 1 minus cosine square x. So we have cosine square x plus 1 minus cosine square x squared, and on expanding the square, we have cosine to the fourth power of x minus 2 cosine square x plus 1 plus cosine square x. Finally, we have cosine to the fourth power of x, terribly sorry about that, cosine to the fourth power of x minus cosine square x plus 1. Now, Let's look for a way to express cosine to the fourth power of x in terms of linear powers of the cosine function. And it would be useful to recall that cosine 2x, the expansion for cosine 2x has a cosine square term in it. And the expansion for cosine 3x has a cosine cube term in it. So that means we could try our luck with a cosine 4x expansion. So cosine 4x can be expanded using the, double, using the double angle formula applied to cosine 2x, which would give me 2 times cosine square 2x minus 1. And again, I have cosine 2x over here, so I could expand that and write this as 2 times 2 cosine square x minus 1, and I have the whole thing squared. And now once I expand the square, I have 2 times 4 cosine to the fourth power of x minus 2 times cosine square x plus 1. No, wait, that's 4 times cosine square. Yeah, perfectly fine. Minus 1 over here. So multiplying by 2 and we have this negative 1 outside means I finally have 8 times cosine to the fourth power of x minus 8 times cosine square x 
plus two minus one would be um, plus one. So we have cosine to the fourth, a uh, cosine of four x on the left hand side, and dividing everything by eight means I have some nice cancellation taking place, and this implies the cosine to the fourth power of x equals cosine of four x. Terribly sorry about that. Divided by eight minus cosine square x. No wait, plus and minus one by eight. Okay, cool. And now, recalling what I had written in purple, we have a cosine to the fourth power of x, and we also have this negative cosine squared term, which is pretty convenient because these two would cancel out. And we have plus one minus one eighth, which is seven eighth, right? So that means on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, we have cosine square x plus sine to the fourth power of x equal to cosine of four x divided by eight plus seven eighths. Okay, cool. And now returning to the integration problem, we have i equal to two pi log two plus the integral from zero to pi by two of the logarithm of this thing, which we just simplified and expressed in terms of the linear power of a trig function, in this case, cosine 4x, we have 1 by 8 times cosine 4x plus 7 dx. And now again, using the properties of the logarithm, we have 2 pi log 2 plus log 1 by 8 times pi by 2, which would be, of course, well, log 1 by 8 times pi by 2, plus the integral from zero to pi by two of the logarithm of seven plus cosine four x dx. Okay, so log one by eight can be written as negative three times log two, and this, in this case we have negative three pi by two times log two, and we have two pi over here, so that means we would have two minus 1.5, which is 0.5. So we have pi by two times log two plus the integral from zero to pi by two of the logarithm of seven plus cosine of four x dx. Now this new integral is itself a pretty interesting case study. So let's call it I sub one. And to solve it, we'll first make the substitution of letting u equal to four times x, and this implies that dx equals a quarter of du. So i sub one is now the integral from, well, as x approaches zero, we have u approaching zero, and as x approaches pi by two, we have u approaching two pi. This factor of one by four outside because of the differential element, and we have the logarithm of seven plus cosine u du. And let's make use of some symmetry here of the cosine curve. So if this is the y and the x-axis, and this is what the cosine of x curve looks like between zero and two pi, we see that it has this nice symmetry about the line. Uh, why am I so bad at this? There we go. We see that it has this really nice symmetry about the line x equals pi. So instead of integrating from 0 to 2 pi, we could just integrate from 0 to pi and double the result. So this implies that i sub 1 is now 1 half the integral from 0 to pi of the logarithm of 7 plus cosine u du. And to solve this integral, we'll use Feynman's trick and solve a more general case by defining an integral function i of some parameter alpha as the integral from zero to pi of the logarithm of the absolute value of alpha plus cosine u du, or, you know, we'll just rename the dummy variable back to x, it doesn't matter anyway. And why exactly am I using absolute values here? Well, applying Feynman's trick to solve an integral is basically just solving an initial, an initial value problem in differential equations. So we need some initial value to work with here. And a useful one would be plugging in alpha equal to zero because that gives us the integral from zero to pi of the logarithm of the absolute value of cosine x 
dx. So the absolute value helps avoid the negative values of the cosine function. And again, because of the symmetry of the cosine curve, we could just integrate from 0 to pi by 2 and double the result. That is because we have, well, the absolute value or the positive values of the cosine function only. So this equals twice the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the logarithm of cosine x dx. And that would be 2 times negative pi by 2 log 2. So that's negative pi times log 2. That's our initial value for the problem. And the target value would be i of 7. So the target integral is actually 1 half of i evaluated at alpha equal to 7. So now that we have our plan sorted out, we can differentiate with respect to the alpha parameter. And on switching up the operators, we now have y, can I never, ah, much better. We now have the integral from 0 to pi of the partial derivative with respect to alpha of the logarithm of absolute value alpha plus cosine x dx. So on differentiating with respect to alpha, we have something divided by alpha plus cosine x. And in case you're wondering if the absolute value sign disappears, well, yes, that is true. You can verify that yourselves by differentiating the logarithm of the absolute value of x. And remember to apply the chain rule to get the derivative of the absolute value of x. Okay, cool. And in the numerator, we conveniently have just the factor of 1. And now this integral looks perfect for applying a wire stress substitution. So we're going to let z equal tangent x by 2. That implies a whole bunch of stuff that leads to the cosine of x being equal to 1 minus z squared divided by 1 plus z squared. And of course, we have dx equal to 2 dz divided by 1 plus z squared. And this implies that i equals, wait, i prime of alpha equals, as x approaches 0, we have tangent 0, which is 0. And as x approaches pi by 2, we have z approaching tangent pi by 2, which of course is positive infinity. The tangent function approaches positive infinity, that is. And we now have 2 times dz divided by 1 plus z squared divided by alpha plus 1 minus z squared divided by 1 plus z squared. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity times 2 of dz divided by 1 plus z squared times alpha plus 1 minus z squared. And now collecting the z squared terms together, we have twice the integral from 0 to infinity of dz divided by z squared times alpha plus 1, correct? Yeah, that's about right. Plus 1 plus, no, wait, wait, wait. It's going to be alpha z squared. This is supposed to be z squared minus, no, it's alpha minus 1 plus 1 plus alpha. Okay, much better. So we have twice the integral from 0 to infinity of dz divided by factoring out an alpha minus 1 term means we have z squared plus alpha plus 1 divided by alpha minus 1. And outside, we have alpha minus 1 in the denominator. Perfect. So that's 2 divided by alpha minus 1 times the inverse tangent of z times root alpha minus 1 divided by alpha plus 1. And of course, we need that factor be multiplied by the inverse tangent function as well. So let me just give myself, rather give this new factor some space. So we have root alpha minus 1 divided by alpha plus 1. The limits here are 0 and infinity. And of course, that means as z approaches 0, we do have, that looks a bit weird. Wait a minute. Much better. As z approaches 0, we have inverse tangent 0, which is 0. And for the limit as z approaches infinity, we have inverse tangent approaching pi by 2. So that means we have 2 divided by some cancellation here. Root alpha minus 1 times alpha plus 1 
times pi by 2. And again, we have some cancellation. So this implies that I prime of alpha equals pi divided by root alpha squared minus 1. Now that we have the derivative of I completely in terms of the alpha parameter, we can recover back the integral function by integrating with respect to the alpha parameter. And on the right-hand side, we would have pi times the antiderivative here is the inverse hyperbolic cosine or the inverse cosh of alpha. So we have pi times inverse cosh of alpha plus c equal to i of alpha. Now to determine the constant of integration, we need to make use of some initial value of the integral function. So recall that my initial value condition was i of 0 equal to negative pi times log 2. So it seems pretty straightforward. We just plug in alpha equal to 0 and we get c. Problem is that's not how it's going to work. Why? Because the cosh of x is never equal to 0. This is strictly non-zero. So I cannot plug in alpha equal to zero on the right-hand side. But wait a minute, does that mean that all the work we've put into the integral up till this point is absolutely useless? I mean, we just wasted our time and effort with this integral, with this particular solution development? Well, no, not at all. We can still solve the integral, and we don't have to start over by any means. This is actually pretty fun because often while solving integrals using Feynman's trick, the major problem is coming up with a suitable integral function. I mean, where to place the parameter and all that. And what should I do to get a suitable initial condition? By suitable, I mean something that would come in handy later. Like right now, we find out that alpha equal to zero is a no-go. So we're going to have to tweak our approach a little bit in real time. So I think that this is extremely cool. I do know that the inverse cosh of 1 is 0, or cosh of 0 is 1, same thing. So instead of using alpha equal to 0, we could try alpha equal to 1. I mean, that does seem promising. But then we have to work out what is i of 1. Now, the integral function was defined as the integral from 0 to pi of the logarithm of alpha, which in this case is 1, plus the cosine of x, dx. And yes, you can scrap the absolute value sign over here. And in case you go with the domain of the integral function being, being alpha greater than or equal to 1, then yeah, you don't need the absolute value from the word go. So this is cool. Now, I'll leave this integral for you guys to evaluate as a bit of a side quest it does indeed evaluate to negative pi times log 2, and as a hint, just use the double angle formula. So that's i of 1. Now all of that means, all we have to do is plug in alpha equal to 1 into the equation we got for i of alpha, and we have negative pi times log 2 equal to pi times inverse cosh of 1 is 0, plus the constant of integration c, implying that the constant convenient, conveniently sorts out to negative pi times log 2. Okay, cool. So that means I have 1, which is 1 half of the integral function evaluated at alpha equal to 7, sorts out to 1 half. No, we, we can factor out pi. So we have pi by 2 times the inverse cosh of 7 minus log 2. So that's i of 1. And the original, the target integral, that is, sorted out to, mm, that was pi by 2 times log 2 plus i sub 1, correct? And i sub 1 sorts out to pi by 2 times the inverse cosh of 7 minus pi by 2 times log 2 with some nice cancellation taking place, implying that the target integral sorts out quite nicely to pi by 2 times the inverse cosh of 7, which is a really cool closed form for our integral. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram. And in case you like the channel, you like the content I'm, put, I'm putting out, and you're learning something from it, consider subscribing, uh, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Thank you. See you next time.